har optimistisk hævdet, at pandemien også rummer et enormt potentiale for forandring af vores samfund. Ser han det løfte indfriet, startede jeg med at spørge. Well, I think on the one hand, it's true that the pandemic has been like an x-ray. So it has exposed structural problems and vulnerabilities and in particular inequalities, which we knew were there, but which hadn't always been as clearly visible. At the same time, if I may use another metaphor, it's also been like a Rorschach test. So everybody immediately saw in the pandemic whatever they wanted to see. So social democrats immediately said, well, this re-empowers the state. Right-wing populists said, look, this shows that people are actually very happy if borders are closed and so on. What will actually happen, and forgive me if this sounds trivial, will depend very much on what we now do and what political parties do with what is still a kind of very malleable situation where many different interpretations could could take hold. I think there is something to be said for the idea that this could that this could um, re-empower notions of social security, but it's not going to happen automatically in a country like the United States. It will depend on what both politicians, but also social movements will actually end up doing. Now, the nation state surely would be a winner. Many also predicted as the pandemic uh, spread in in the early spring. Uh, has it been? I would say that the state has been a winner in the sense of people getting a feeling that when the chips are down, when it really matters, yes, it is the state who protects me, who exercises authority in a particular kind of way. With, of course, notable exceptions like uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil or t- uh, Trump in the US, who basically sort of gave up on governing, were never terribly interested in governing uh, in the in the first place. But the state is not always quite the same as the nation state. And I'm skeptical of the view that this will necessarily play into the hands of right wing populists and nationalists, because ultimately this was not really about your nationality. Uh, it was about where you were and you posed a danger or you couldn't travel because of your particular territorial position and had nothing to do with ethnicity, with culture, with anything of that sort. And the business model, especially of right-wing populists, has always been to wage culture war and to basically stoke fear about minorities, about foreign invaders, about alien cultures taking over and so on. And I don't think that frame works particularly well in the current situation. Again, of course, people have tried and there's mm-hmm. plenty of of rhetoric about blaming China and so on. But I don't see that this frame fits terribly, terribly well. So state, yes, but nationalism in a strict sense of culture or even ethnicity, no. And who would you say at this point in time has been the uh, the political losers of the pandemic? So people have been very quick to say that this shows that populists can't really govern, they pander to the people, look what a disaster Brazil and the US have been. That's true, but in my view, populism is not characterized by distrust of expertise as such. It's characterized by politicians saying, only we truly represent the people. And we can draw a distinction, to put it very crudely, between smart populists like Viktor Orban in Hungary, who had a very quick approach to the pandemic, who have been very restrictive, and not so smart populists like Bolsonaro and Trump, who basically refused to deploy the state machinery, who only could wear culture, wage culture war, because that's the only thing they really know how to do. And at the same time, maybe less obviously, also continue doing what they've been doing from day one, of their time in government, namely to deregulate like crazy. So it's not quite true that Trump or Bolsonaro have done nothing. They have essentially made it even easier for agribusiness, for oil and gas to pollute pollute the uh, to pollute the environment. So I don't think that has worked terribly well, but it's too quick to say, oh, this generally shows that populism is bound to fail in these situations. Smart, experienced populists who actually have an interest in governing have done not so badly. And in fact, they've used this opportunity, they've used the kind of chaos and lack of vocal attention internationally to grab even more powers, to restrict freedoms permanently, to entrench themselves even more. Again, someone like Orban in Hungary is the best example for this. 
Now, others have predicted that populists um, would be decimated in a crisis where it's obvious to everyone that the expertise of, of experts, of, of bureaucrats, normally favorite hate figures of populists, is crucial. What has happened there? So again, I would emphasize that it's not a prime characteristic of populism to distrust experts or bureaucrats as, as such. It, it can play a part, of course, in terms of their anti-elite rhetoric. But what always comes first is the claim that they and only they represent what they often call the real people or also the silent majority. So anti-pluralism really matters. The fact that all other contenders for power are illegitimate and that all those citizens who don't support the populists basically don't truly belong to the people at all. That's why Trump always calls critics un-American. This is why Kaczynski in Poland right now brought up all kinds of anti-Semitic stereotypes to defeat, uh, to defeat the liberals. That's really what comes, what comes first. And to some degree, that strategy can be compatible with populists in government basically bringing their own experts and having bureaucrats in place who will basically also make sure that their power is unconstrained, that they can entrench themselves even further in the way that the likes of, again, Orban, Kaczynski, Modi in India, for instance, have, have done. So I worry that, again, we might be in danger of underestimating these actors. I think we still cling to the notion that almost by definition, populists cannot really govern because either one thinks that all their policies are so crazy and irrational that everything will fail in practice, or one assumes, also a very popular idea among liberals, that these are all simply anti-elite actors. And once they get into government, of course, they themselves in a certain way become the establishment and they can't govern against themselves. But that sort of rhetoric or the, this sort of assessment only works on the basis of what I take to be a flawed understanding of the, of the phenomenon. And we have so many populist regimes by now in power and for such a long time that I think it's naive to think that all these, all these actors will somehow fail by themselves. En af Møllers faste danske læsere. Velkommen. 